Good afternoon and welcome all. My name is Joe Farong. I'm an engagement engineer at Tableau. Our team works with customer found bugs to make all the Tableau products better and more reliable for all of you, our customer. Today I have the distinct pleasure to introduce one of our newer Zen masters, Layla Mannheim. Layla is from Arizona and she's a lead analytics engineer for product experience at Pluralsight, a um, online technology learning platform. She holds a master's degree in library and information science with a focus on user-centered information design and she has a bachelor's degree in art history. She is the creator of such awesome visits as sidewalk egg frying days. That's one of my favorites. Also, the uh, rise and fall of uh, movie franchises. I'm a big movie fan, and this is about a graphical look at audience and box office successes of some of the most loved and some of the most unloved uh, movie franchises out there. Layla is a very active blogger, a contributor to the Tableau community. I'm really impressed with her fundraiser, She Talks Data, where she collaborated with Brett Kava and Chloe Singh to set up a fund to provide the opportunity for women from the Tableau community to attend their first Tableau conference. For those in the... <clears throat> For those in the room that are here because of She Talks Data, I welcome you to TC18. The support of community and helping others in this way is an important part of the Tableau culture and our values. Leila's talk today is titled Metaphorically Visiting. Please join me in welcoming Lilac or Leila Mannheim <laughs> to the stage. Thank you. Your nerves get through. Thanks, Joe. Hi. Um, okay, so I was going to start by getting the ads out of the way first. So please remember to fill out the survey. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So today's agenda, just a quick look at what we're going to cover. First, we're going to start with just a little bit of definitions of what is a visual metaphor. And then just a little tiny bit of science of how metaphors work. And with those out of the way, we'll talk about um, what uh, visual metaphors actually look like in data visualization. And then the fun part, we will look at uh, three examples uh, from my own Tableau Public, so you can, if you'd like, uh, download them and take a look at them. Um, of uh, metaphorical visits. And then at the very end, I will uh, walk you through my metaphorically visiting design process. So we're going to start with uh, definitions, but first, I would like you all to meet Spencer. He is, uh, he just turned one, and uh, as you can see, he, he loves to help. And um, at sitting, he's uh, just a little bit taller than a 15-inch laptop, but it's mostly ears, so I don't know if we want to count that. So I wanted to start today with a little, a little trivia challenge. Um, I want to see if any of you guys could guess, or do the math real quick, um, how many cats could comfortably fit uh, inside the Empire State Building? Now I'll give you a little hint, the ASPCA puts out a guideline that in order to make cats comfortable, uh, you should, yes, so you should, you should uh, keep about 18 square feet uh, per cat to keep them comfortable. So, I'll give you a little minute to do the math, but when you're ready, um, you can tweet it to this hashtag, and my lovely assistant over here, Caesar is uh, going to track those. And the first three that get it right, or tweet it right, get some plural side swag. 
<laughs> so, other than you know showing off my adorable cat, uh, part of the reason for showing that was that that is an example of um, visual metaphor, and um, I wanted to start off uh, then in the definition by uh, showing you a few of a few other uh, examples in DataViz of visual metaphors that I really like. So this one is by Yvette. I'm sure you've seen it around the place once or twice. Um, so in here, uh, she is showing uh, the gender and uh, racial inequality in tech salaries. And each one of those um, identity components are shown as a leaf on a flower. And I like this especially because it's very complex. You could spend a long time looking at it um, and exploring it, but you can really spot right away that there are certain flowers there that uh, are easy. It's easy to see that they're not. They don't look like we know flowers should look. Um, a second one that I really liked is uh, Michael Mixon's. Uh, this is a, a, a Michael Monday submission, I believe. It is um, visualizing the shrinking sea ice. And you can tell by looking at it a little closely that it is really just a one of the most default charts there are. It's a line chart. But just with a little bit of intentional kind of metaphorical uh, formatting choices, he's turned this into a, a very, very powerful picture of the problem. And this one is, um, I don't believe, is made in Tableau, although it could be. Um, this one uh, is showing a, a rock's bloody, bloody toll, and you can see, again, by looking closely, that it really is just a bar chart, but with, um, again, intentional um, kind of figurative color choices and just flipping the axis around, he's able to take a lot of really big numbers that are very, would otherwise be very hard to grasp and remember, certainly, uh, and makes this into really an, an unfor unforgettable image. So those all look very, very different. They're different chart types, and, um, but they are all definitely uh, uh, metaphorical visas and visual metaphors. So um, the reason why I personally think that these are all um, metaphors and defective metaphors are because they answer this question, this big universal question that we all have uh, in our lives, but also when we look at numbers and at data viz, and that is, what does it all mean? Um, so, hopefully we don't have that expression when we're looking at most data viz. <laughs> um, so, I think it's, we, it's our instinct to find meaning in the data that we're looking at, but also especially um, find some, when we find something personally meaningful, it uh, kind of triggers a lot of our cognitive processes and um, makes, it's part of what makes those visualizations more engaging and effective. So some of those are attention. If you, um, if you think about, uh, you're looking at something that you connect with, it re resonates with you personally, um, it, you're more likely to invest more or be willing to invest more attention to it. Um, there's also, uh, the whole understanding process of how we just interact with new information. Um, and then uh, you, you will probably also be more motivated to um, put in the effort to retain that information. And then finally, maybe arguably the most important, um, you'll be more motivated to uh, do something with it and that will be either taking action on it um, or even uh, being open to changing a belief that you've held for a long time. So how do metaphors achieve all of that magic? Um, I uh, thought it would be appropriate to uh, explain this with a meta metaphor. And so I think um, metaphors work like bridges because they really help you to connect the unfamiliar to the familiar. So you see a visual with numbers that you are unfamiliar with um, and you are able to understand it because you're connecting it to something that you are very familiar with. And part of how that works so well, especially in data viz, is with uh, these structures that we, we use to store our, our um, existing knowledge, and that is mental models. How many people have heard of mental models here? All right, so I'm, I'm gonna give you my like 
second grade version of the, of the like definition. It, it's involved in a, a lot of psych psychological processes, but for our purposes, um, I think, um, so if you think of the bridge, right, your bridge is probably, probably looks a lot different than the bridge that I have in my mind. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, we do have a um, very simplified shared definition of what a bridge does, uh, and that is our mental model of a bridge. So we know that, uh, we don't know how exactly with the, uh, the engineering magic that's involved, but we know that bridges connect point A to point B. And so by explaining metaphor, how metaphors work this way, now you instantly understand how metaphors work because you understand how a bridge works in this simplified way. Um, so in DataViz in particular, uh, there are two components to visual metaphors. You have uh, the conceptual and the visual. The conceptual is the analogy or the comparison itself. So it's how is X um, related to Y or like Y. And then the visual is um, basically all the, all the things that we do in Tableau. It's uh, all, basically any graphical element that you're using to represent that uh, metaphor. So it can be a point or a line or a polygon or an image even or an icon. Types of visual metaphors. Um, I like to think about it on a spectrum. So you go from the most literal to the most abstract, and that's on both those levels that we just talked about. That's uh, your visual can have literal to abstract, and so can your conceptual. So um, the on the very literal end is um, one. It's visual metaphors that are using. Uh, literal, both visual and conceptual. So the um, Spencers in the uh, Empire State Building would definitely be in the literal end. Uh, but it's uh, it's often ones. It's probably uh, the most common ones you've seen. It's uh, it's visual metaphors that are taking some big number and they're uh, representing it in terms of um, uh, some physical object. On the very other end is. Uh, uh, a lot, takes a lot more, um, it's a lot more complex. And uh, those are uh, often comparing, using comparison to something intangible, like a process or how something is structured. And I think those are also um, a lot like abstract art. They're um, kind of a little, maybe a little more open to interpretation. Um, so we'll see one of those later. And, uh, and then in the middle, I just picked a few a few points here and a few examples, but um, you can really have a range of, a combination of literal to abstract. Okay. Uh -huh. So our case studies. We are going to start with the very uh, literal, literal side of the uh, spectrum. And I'm going to show you a Viz that I made uh, of uh, part of Makeover Monday that was showing the um, um, the art dimensions in the Tate, uh, Tate Museum collection. Yeah. So the data was basically um, all the metadata that uh, the museum kind of tracks on the artworks in their collection. The um, focus that I, what I decided to focus on was just the um, just the size element. There's a um, crazy amount of uh, information on each of the artwork, um, but uh, I decided to focus just on the size and how the size relates to our art viewing experience. And the metaphor here is um, you see that little person uh, that is supposed to be a six foot person. So um, how does uh, the size of each artwork compared to a six foot person. And so here, the comparison is, uh, you know, that the, um, very literal one that we talked about, it's converting a number to some sort of concept. So we have the artworks dimensions are, um, are referencing the uh, reference person's height. 
And then in the in terms of the visual, it's uh, got two components. One, the first one is slightly, very slightly abstracted. It's uh, the rectangles and they're representing the picture frames. And then the second part is on the is you know the most literal that you can have. It's uh, actual image silhouette of a person and that is representing the, the reference type person. So why does this work? Um, this one you will kind of see repeating throughout. I think this is probably the, the key most important um, element that you have to have in an effective um, visual metaphor. Uh, and that is that it is, uh, the comparison itself is central to the main point of the visualization. So in this one, um, I'm basically uh, uh, kind of looking at what does size actually mean to a person that's there looking at the artwork. And so even uh, regardless of whether it's, it's small or it's a small or big artwork, I personally think that um, the size has a huge impact on how we experience it. And so that's why I decided to focus uh, this this data presentation on um, what that viewing experience is like. So uh, showing it for the Tate collection as a whole and for each of the individual artists over the years that they have in the collection. So a couple other reasons why uh, this one works. Uh, the first one is that um, it is based on a well-known concept. So if you think about building those bridges to something familiar, obviously you want the the, sum, the target of the metaphor to be something that'll be familiar to your audience. Um, and then the last one is, more, is much more of a um, design, on the design level, and that's um, uh, adding both a visual and a textual explanation really helps to um, make it easier to learn what is, uh, what is going on and basically learn how to read the more metaphor and connect it to the, the chart in the viz. Second example is uh, on the abstract side, <laughs> um, and it is showing um, tweets, hashtag tweets from last year's conference. Although there are definitely some some repeats this year, as there are many years. Um, so the data uh, was um, uh, hashtag. Well, it was actually all all the tweets, but I focused just on the hashtags and the, the tweets for each hashtag. Hashtag, and um, what I really wanted to focus was to focus on was the um, how conversations evolved. So um, both how long a conversation lasted, but also how um, quiet or loud it became, and whether it kind of uh, it, the pacing of it, and and if it started loud and ended up kind of just dying down, or if it was just continually maintained. Um, and so the metaphor I used here is a sonar radar, so that each um, each one of those like set of concentric concentric circles are one re uh, representing one hashtag, um, and so you can see kind of um, as time uh, is kind of with each wave of the of the sonar, we get a changed evolved picture of the uh, conversation. Um, now this is definitely on the abstract end. So I've actually been told that some people, so you can see I, uh, you can see it a little bit, maybe not in the back, how I added the explanation um, on the bottom there of what, what the metaphor is. I tend to do that in, in most of the visits. But some people, it's kind of a, I guess a classic uh, uh, known user experience thing that not everyone reads when you, <laughs> the instructions you put on there. But it doesn't matter because, so I've heard that some people uh, uh, actually thought it was like ripples. Um, but I think that's really similar to how abstract is abstract art is uh, kind of experience that we don't always um, interpret it like the artist initially intended, but we still interpret it, so. Um, let's see. So here, uh, again, this, so this is uh, a lot more complex. So the metaphor has a lot more uh, components to it. So in the conceptual side, we have change over time in a hashtag conversation is 
uh, being compared to the change over time in sonar waves. And then the visual, we have the circles, uh, each of the circles representing the sonar waves. Then the, they're sized by the uh, time that's gone by from, when, from the hour when the first tweet on that hashtag was created. And then in addition to that, I'm layering on um, this additional information that helps to kind of tell the story of what the pace of that conversation was. So uh, the color represents the total tweets in each hour. And then the position, I'm using a um, scatter plot to uh, kind of position each of the um, hashtags overall. So you can see that um, the, um, sorry. <laughs> So you can see uh, the more popular hashtags are towards the, you know, the top right, and it's based on total tweets and total tweeters. Um, so this one works because, uh, again, it's, uh, so I'm not gonna go so much into it, but uh, it still has that, um, the metaphor is based on something central to the data story that's being told. But I think um, the uh, key lesson here is that um, it's based, it's taking a well-known concept like the radar, um, um, the sonar radar, and um, it help, it's helping us to understand a chart that's completely new that we haven't seen before. Um, and the other part of it is, this is also not a very usual way of looking at time. Usually we look at time from start to end. We wanna understand how things have change the direction it's moved. Um, and uh, in those situations, we, it's totally um, advisable to go with the best practice and do you know, something like a line chart or maybe a spark line. But what happens when you wanna show kind of non-linear aspects of time? So, uh, and you're more interested in comparing things that maybe um, evolved the same way or happened the same way, but didn't start at the same time. So, some of these, um, I don't know how clearly you can see these, but some of these hashtags are probably familiar to you. I participated in the pick with the pause this year. That was, that was, that was fun. Um, but uh, you can see here now that so something like um, Makeover Monday and Data Plus Women looks like about the same size, um, but we know they start at slightly different times. And if you look at the colors and the um, sizes of the circles more closely, you can see that it definitely had different pacing and some had more um, lulls uh, in between um, kind of active periods than others. And then we can also look at um, the added from the tweeter's perspective. Um, and so here we're looking at total tweets um, versus uh, how many likes and, and uh, retweets. And so uh, we have someone like Britt, who is sitting right there, <laughs> um, who tweeted throughout the conference, and she also had a lot of, a lot of viewership. But um, we also have some people like Anya that um, had high impact and uh, you know, high visibility even without um, a ton of tweets. So third example is right in the middle, uh, less abstract. Um, and let's see, uh, the conceptual metaphor here though is, is um, definitely on the abstract side. And uh, you can see, I think it's a good example of um, packing in a ton of information, um, but presenting it in, in a metaphor that really helps us like, understand all that information or compare the cities um, on, on a bunch of uh, like different attributes at the same time. But uh, this is a, definitely a complex metaphor. Um, so I will try to remember exactly how to describe it. So uh, we have, first of all, so it is looking, it's using uh, uh, census data on commuting, commuting flow, um, like daytime versus nighttime population, and also uh, just general city population. And so what I did is I classified the cities, each one of those bars is a city, and so I classified the cities into three kind of commuting personalities. So we got the, the really light ones, 
that are um, working cities. So that means there's more people there in the daytime than um, uh, the nighttime. The uh, living cities, the, the brighter green ones, are the opposite. There are more people um, there during the nighttime. And the working and living, living cities are a combination of, like they, they just don't change that much. So that doesn't mean that they don't have a lot of commuters coming in. It just means that on overall there's a balance and we don't know from, from what attribute that, that is coming from, um, but that generally they are uh, not changing uh, a whole lot in the overall daytime population. So um, each one of, to, to kind of, um, the personalities are kind of visualized in that uh, skyline, that city building skyline. Um, but then each of the attributes that are contributing to kind of different, uh, so there's an attribute that is, um, that uh, drives the position of each city building, and there's one that drives the, the width and the height, and so each one of those is also being visualized in the, um, in the histograms up there, so you can, um, if you want to explore it more closely, you can still kind of understand the components that make up each city's uh, commuting personality. So, for example, we can uh, take a look at the personality of New York City. Um, and that is, and you can also see it's highlighted in the, the location is highlighted in the um, histograms there. And so uh, New York City is a working and living city. Um, and, uh, but you can see that, so you can see that it is still changing a little bit, it's, it is getting, more people incoming during the daytime, um, but it definitely has uh, one of the highest uh, kind of percentage of people that uh, live there and work there. And compared to that, we can see that Boston's personality is a whole lot different. Um, and I, I know as, as a uh, Bostonian myself um, that everyone from Boston and New York would definitely agree that our city's personalities are a lot different. Um, I've, uh, I have a bias for Boston, of course, but you know, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so okay, the conceptual comparison here, uh, variation, it, uh, overall summary of the complex uh, uh, metaphor, the variation in the city commuting behavior on all those different attributes is being represented as the variation in building size and the position along the skyline. Then the visual uh, is showing um, a bar chart. So like kind of we saw in, in the early examples, it's a super common, you know, most, um, um, uh, like most known chart that there is probably. Um, but it's being formatted in such a way to represent buildings in the city skyline. So I think that's a big part of why it works. So um, the, I, I think skylines a lot, um, a lot of times we're already used to seeing them as a portrait of a city. You can often, in a lot of big cities, find uh, postcards with like the skyline portrait of a city. So we're just kind of used to, to like seeing that as, um, is a presentation of like a, um, uh, kind of like a, in a way, a, a city's personality. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, it's a familiar chart. Um, most, the most default of default charts um, used in an unfamiliar way and used with some, um, some uh, like intentional design choices. So you can see, like, could have easily just done a histogram bar chart. Um, it's presenting some uh, similar information. It, I think it's like two of the three components that are in the, the, other, the main viz, but with a little bit of to completely default uh, Tableau magic, we turn it into a picture of a skyline. <laughs> So hopefully you guys were able to spot some common themes in all of those. Uh, but I um, have basically two that I'll, I'll just kind of point out as um, really key to effective metaphors in, in data viz. 
So first is it's really not about presentation. I think, um, I know for me when I started talking about doing this talk, um, the reaction I got when I said visual metaphor made me think that a, a lot of times we tend to think a visual metaphor is kind of the, um, the presentation layer, the finding, um, you know, the best way to, to um, do just like the, the aesthetic component of it and uh, make it pretty. Um, but I, uh, I really think that, um, if, like, so as we saw that one of the main, um, one, the main things that was important in all of those examples was how central the metaphor was to the data story that was being told. And so really it's not, um, it's not about finding the, you know, the best practice or most um, necessarily the most effective way to visualize the data itself. It's really about finding uh, the most effective way to um, visually explain uh, what it is that you're trying to show. Um, and so if you uh, think about like how do we, how do we really explain things, um, it's not, uh, not an easy thing necessarily, but um, for example, how um, would you explain hunger to someone who's never had to go hungry before? Um, how would you explain your favorite song to someone who's never heard it before or to someone who's definitely never heard music before? Um, or how would you explain uh, the size of the Empire State Building to someone who's never um, seen it in person before? Maybe not with cats, I admit, okay. <laughs> so um, the last section is, oh, I'm sorry, the uh, last point is, um, again, something we kind of wove, wove throughout, is you're really trying to help people find that meaning and find something that they can personally relate to with that meaning. So that is helpful in both um, uh, in kind of improving how quickly and easily people can understand what's going on in visualization, but also like the why it matters and why they should care, which of course, the, if you can't supply that to them, they're not gonna be interested in doing, taking any action on it. So, uh, now I'm gonna tell you about the uh, design process that I follow and that I hope you will decide to follow. So I'll, I'll give you a fair warning, this is like the evangelizing part of my talk. Um, I hope up to now you, you were able to, uh, like I've, I've convinced you that um, it's useful to, to have uh, metaphorical, to have metaphors in your data visualization and um, to add that component to it. But I really, really um, hope that what you all walk out of here with is being convinced to um, approach your design process in this way, um, in more of a metaphorically pissing way. Um, and, uh, but the key point that uh, I think is maybe hard to get over is that um, it doesn't, do meta like metaphorically busying and creativity doesn't just happen. Um, you really have to have an intentional design process that will give you the space to um, like think in this way and brainstorm in this way. Um, and, and it might seem like uh, a little crazy to spend a whole lot of time outside of Tableau, but I promise that it will really, um, it'll make a huge effort, a, a huge difference in uh, like what you create, the output of what you create, and um, how, how people kind of engage with your work and, and um, uh, what they do with uh, the information they learn after they, they see your bits. So these are the overall stages at a very high level. So I will um, explain these each of these stages, but then I'll also show an example with um, one, of the, one of the examples I showed earlier. So you can see kind of in practice what, what this uh, design process looks like. Um, before we do that, I think uh, the really key thing for me is, is this kind of um, repetitive um, flow that you go through in each of these stages. Um, and that's kind of going from a very open mindset to a closed mindset. Um, and so you can see uh, in stage one and three, that's when you, it's really important to have an open mindset. So in your first stage, you're gathering as much information as you can find and trying to really uh, 
um, ex uh, extend all the questions that you can ask about your topic. Um, and then at the end of that phase, you find something that you really want to focus on, and that's when you start um, kind of whittling down and um, um, trying to remove any uh, like non-necessary topics that you you might still have in your data. And then in the imagine phase, again, you're expanding, but this time with ideas. So you're trying to um, find as many ideas as possible of, of ways to uh, visualize your data um, that you're focusing on. And then again, uh, in the, the last stage, you're taking that golden nugget that you found in your last one, at the end of your last phase, the imagine phase, and you're um, uh, kind of trying to remove anything extraneous that is not um, completely necessary for uh, representing that idea. Um, so just, again, to reiterate how important it is to be completely uh, like all in on uh, having an open mindset and like making, making mistakes and having crazy ideas and asking questions that might be completely unrelated, uh, finding data that might be completely unrelated. Um, and in the imagine phase especially, like thinking of ideas even though uh, you know they might be completely impossible to build, uh, this is a stage to not worry about whether it's possible or impossible. So the discover phase, um, and the first two phases I uh, won't go too much into because I think if you're using Tableau, you're pretty, this is what you do every day, you're pretty, you should be pretty familiar with it. But um, this is the uh, get to know the data phase of the, the relationship. Um, the, so you're doing data exploration, and this is exploration to understand what are the data elements, um, what, is, what does one role mean? Um, and uh, I like to think of it as uh, kind of looking at one row as a sentence. No, you will like that. <laughs> looking at one row as a sentence. So if, if your one row is a sentence, what is the subject of that sentence? That's kind of your, your um, granularity, if you will. And then um, looking at the, all the other dimensions and measures as um, kind of like either verbs or, or adjectives, but what are they telling you about that subject of that row? Um, and then the research is very, very important. So sometimes you will have domain knowledge and you um, won't need to do as much, as much research, but this is research of things you can't find in the data. So how is, one, how is that one row being created out there in the real world? Um, and what are some mistakes or missing things that can happen along the way that can impact how, uh, you know, the final output and how you might uh, interpret that uh, one row. And then uh, finding the focus um, is really, you know, you're, you're um, finding the, it could be either a question um, that you're gonna answer with uh, a subset of that data or even uh, just um, a specific um, field or a couple of fields that you really want to focus on and which you will be exploring in this second phase. So here is the more um, uh, kind of uh, focus exploration of that uh, smaller subset of data that you have. Um, so the initial exploration is just what does that data look like? What's the shape? What's, the, what's normal? What are some maybe outliers there and, and are they interesting or are they should they just be removed? Um, and then, uh, you know, looking for interesting patterns and relationships and things that break those patterns and relationships. Um, and really what you're doing is uh, looking for all the interesting threads that, um, that strike your curiosity or that answer that question best. Um, and those are the things that we are going to take with us to focus on the next step. Now for the next step, there is one really, really important um, uh, step that you cannot miss, and that is you have to stop everything. Shut down the computer, uh, don't look at the data, uh, and even close your eyes if you need to do that to not like think about the data. Um, but uh, really, we, we need to like remove, in order to have that like open mindset, we really need to 
uh, remove ourselves from any, like the, the thinking process of um, what, what Tableau can make or how Tableau can constrain us or how the data structure can constrain us. And um, uh, I know I said the next step was brainstorming, but before we brainstorm the solutions, we first need to um, like get to the um, like true or the, the core meaning that we, we want to have for our data story. So it's kind of like the, if we found, in the last step, if we found what's interesting, now we're trying to figure out why is it interesting. Um, and then um, you're also just kind of looking for the, um, uh, another way to think about it is you're looking for the core truth so that we can have a metaphor that we're designing that is going to be central to those um, core truths. And uh, this is my favorite phase, but it does take some practice. So imagining uh, brainstorming solutions. So this is really uh, uh, taking that, whatever we figured out that is the reason why it's interesting, whatever that story is. And um, now we're focusing on like designing that bridge to something familiar. So what are some things that are going to be familiar to our audience um, that would be good ways to kind of uh, represent or explain that, um, uh, the metaphor. Um, so I think that um, sometimes, very rarely, you uh, have kind of like that instant light bulb moment and you do, you can, just by um, all the kind of uh, thinking work that you've done in the previous phase of figuring out why it's important, you'll also know how, like what the metaphor is going to be. But that's very, very, very rare. So um, there are things you can do to kind of, so, so you should kind of expect to invest some um, uh, mental effort in uh, brainstorming solutions or brainstorming um, like metaphors that, that could be good in terms of explaining this uh, data story. Um, and so for that, um, sometimes it works to just do uh, like very, um, uh, I guess basic um, brainstorming techniques like mind mapping or affinity diagramming or things like that. Uh, but a lot of times you have to kind of uh, set it aside and go do something completely different. So um, take a walk because nature has a lot of um, really awesome metaphors to be inspired by. Um, if you're an art geek like me, uh, go to a museum. <laughs> or even if you're not an art geek like me, uh, uh, also, um, I would suggest, uh, you know, um, what's it called, uh, uh, Netflix or Hulu or anything like that. Um, and uh, just, I think, kind of being prepared to have it take some time and to kind of, like, um, accepting, like, uh, kind of, I think a lot of times when you stop looking for something, that's when you end up finding, finding something, so. Um, just being prepared to not not maybe do it in the same day or the same week. Um, and I think also just generally uh, being um, more aware of when you are taking a walk, being more aware of like looking for things and thinking about how they could be used as metaphors um, is kind of helpful because you're kind of like building this um, mental bank of metaphors that you can use and then it's easier for you to uh, come up with metaphors without without uh, all that work. So. And the final step, uh, building it back in Tableau. So first, figuring out is it even possible in Tableau? Um, I know a lot of people would argue that anything is possible, but you know, depends on how much work you want to put in. <laughs> um, but um, really figure, at this step, it's figuring out is it Tableauable, but also um, uh, like, uh, uh, kind of general, if it's gonna be something that's not default, kind of a general approach and what the data is gonna to have to look like in order to make it um, easy on yourself to build it in Tableau. Um, and then um, the final uh, step is just as important is um, looking very intentionally and very like deliberately what other design elements out of all the visual encoding tools that we have at our disposal, um, which of those can we use in order to enhance the metaphor 
make it easier to understand, and make it easier to, to see the story. Um, and so then next, I am just going to show you how I applied this design process to uh, the first example we saw, which is the um, T uh, artworks. So what I am discovering in the, the first part of Discover, um, what does one of the uh, things look like? What does one of the rows look like? Um, so for this particular case, it was one artwork, but more specifically, um, one artwork that was in the T collection. Um, and for each one of those artworks, the, this is what was on there. So like a, a physical description of the artwork and then also the artist and the year, among others. Um, and then for uh, researching the data sets, so like I mentioned, sometimes you have uh, that um, personal knowledge that's gonna help you to, to know what are all the pitfalls there. So I was lucky in, in this perspective. Um, but so I knew um, partly from an early internship in a museum gallery that art metadata is uh, like notoriously um, not reliable. And it's just because of, if you think of the process of how it's created, sometimes by curators of shows, sometimes by uh, you know, other, other positions in the museum, but over time, and they're all gonna be describing the artwork in completely different ways. Um, and sometimes it's actually just, uh, if it's a donation of a collection, um, it'll just be the description that the people who own the collection had. Um, and uh, the other part that's really uh, impactful is the, the practice of collecting art itself, the decision of what to include, and not to include is gonna have um, a big impact on um, kind of your population of, of artworks. Um, and so I did a little bit of online research for this one, uh, but in other situations where I don't have that, um, the, the luck to have the, the domain knowledge on that, um, I just kind of wanted to reiterate how important it is because um, this is not information that you would ever be able to get out of the data, but just looking at the data. And then the final piece of the discover phase is uh, what, it, what do I find interesting uh, and, or interesting enough to, uh, to spend more time uh, focusing on visualizing. Uh, so I decided to focus on the size and that was partly because I knew it was um, the most, probably the most reliable data element, um, but also because I thought um, it was really uh, such an important part of describing an artwork. So exploring that uh, size element, I looked at the height and the width, um, and then also looked at those elements for the different artists across time. And especially with the, with the overall distribution, it was, it was pretty easy to see that it was definitely distributed towards the uh, smaller side of things. So um, next was, stepping away from Tableau and uh, figuring out why, why it was interesting. So um, I um, really, at this point, started thinking about what, what does size mean to the viewer? And I talked a little bit about this before, but I um, went and dug through my old pictures. Um, and so, um, like Joe mentioned, I, I was an art history major in, uh, as a bachelor's. And I remember in our textbooks, learning about the Nike statue and not being that, uh, among other artworks, it wasn't that impressive to me. But then when I was lucky enough to actually see it in person, um, it, uh, it was definitely a different experience. Um, and so uh, I kind of thought through um, how I felt at the moment of that experience and how I uh, try and uh, try again many, many times to capture everything just right. But like, even though you can, there's the saying goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, for me, I don't know if it's my amateur 
photography skills or what, but even a thousand pictures, I didn't have quite a thousand, but even a thousand pictures can't really capture the full experience. Um, but I started thinking about um, how could it be possibly captured in a database picture. And so the, uh, uh, that's kind of like the mental path I, I took to, to get to the, the metaphor that I wanted. So I knew um, I wanted the story to be really about how do we, how can I relate size to um, the person who's there experiencing it. And so for this example, it was like a pretty instant decision to um, use a, like a pretty literal metaphor and um, uh, compare the, um, uh, like the size to a person who was six feet. Um, and kind of so you could quickly see which ones were bigger and which ones were smaller. Um, but then uh, it was um, a more like deliberate uh, design choice to think about how literal or abstract it should be. So I decided to go with a more kind of like a slightly abstracted um, squares because I wanted, I thought it was really important to um, not have people focus on just one artwork, but really see the overall, um, most of the artworks were smaller, on the smaller end of things. So for implementing it, um, I uh, started thinking about first um, what I wanted it to look like, what I wanted Tableau to be able to draw. So. Uh, I like to think about it in terms of, again, like one or maybe two rows. So uh, if I had a really big painting and a really small painting, um, what should it look like? I want it to look like that, mostly. Um, and then figuring out um, what information uh, Tableau needed in order to be able to draw it. Um, and uh, so I, I like to, um, I feel like my, on my learning curve to uh, be able to achieve things that are not quite default. Um, it's really helped me to think of each worksheet as like its own universe, and Tableau really only knows what's in that universe. And so um, the figuring out what data is needed to do what, what you want uh, uh, Tableau to do is you kind of figure out, okay, well, what is Tableau going to need to know in order to be able to draw the picture that I am um, imagining in my head? Um, so, the next step after that was to enhance the metaphor or see if there were things I could use to enhance the metaphor. And so, again, I, I referenced my list of visual tools um, that I kind of had in my disposal. So, shape and size, I already was using. Um, so next down the list was color. Of course, that's the, that's the big one. Um, but I so started thinking about what are there, was there any element in the data or in the kind of story I was trying to tell that could be communicated and kind of uh, adding information that was um, useful and not just extra. Um, and I decided that I definitely um, wanted to include that um, quantity component. So to be able to show with color which of the sizes are uh, more popular. Um, so started out with just uh, trying out transparency. And so that uh, was a little better. Uh, I liked how you could definitely see the, the brighter um, kind of section is where there was uh, you know, more popular sizes, but the sparse areas were now like kind of hard to see. Um, so then I was, uh, start an experiment, can I do color plus transparency? Um, and uh, this definitely worked um, a, little, a little better, but it still wasn't quite happy with it. Um, what I really wanted to, was a two color shift, and I, uh, um, but, but the level of detail was basically at the artwork level, so I didn't think this was uh, really possible with Tableau, but, um, if you try really hard to think about how to do it, you usually can. So I went back to version one, made it even more transparent, and um, then I uh, um, used another axis uh, with this deep purple that was set also a little transparent, but not quite. And then 
put that together and you have a, a fake deep purple to two white um, and you still have that brighter color in the area that, you, um, that has more data. Um, and then finally, just adding the, um, the silhouette image and the explanation. So at the very end, or when I think it's the very end of my design, I always spend some time looking at it from the viewer's perspective and trying to see if there's either text explanation or other things we can add that um, will make it easier to, for someone who's never seen it before to look, kind of learn and orient themselves and uh, understand it. So um, finally, I just wanted to uh, explain why I chose uh, this title, other than you know, I thought it was, it was um, a pretty good um, uh, session title that would stand out. Um, I really am, uh, I think it's metaphorically visiting should be looked at as a verb. Um, it's really uh, changing the, uh, it's like a way of thinking and looking at data. Um, and uh, I, but I realized that especially if you're not used to it, um, it, imagining isn't really easy. Imagining metaphor isn't easy. Um, and I think we, we tend to think of the um, creative process as just something that happens along the way. Um, you know, we, we look at the data and we are kind of, uh, you know, playing with it and looking for insights and, uh, you know, then kind of picking the best visualization way uh, to present it. And we assume that if, you know, if, an, if a good creative idea comes, it's just going to come from looking at the data. Um, but that's, I think that's like a really big fallacy because we're actually, um, we may or may not be aware of it, but we have spent all this time kind of learning how to look at data like a scientist. Like we're, we're looking at it for um, the patterns and the things that don't fit the patterns. Um, and uh, it's, we're kind of not looking, we're trying to find the core truths in there, but we're not looking, we're kind of not like uh, looking away and thinking about what could be and what's, what's not there, but could still be a good explanation of it. Um, so, uh, I think the, you know, the cliche, um, you can't think outside the box um, when you're just constantly looking just from the box. So, um, but in, in more, uh, in less cliche terms, uh, creative ideas are like, are hard. You need to like really develop your creative thinking muscles. And the more you do it, just like with any, any other workout, uh, the more likely you'll uh, you'll be better at it and it, it'll come easier. But even still, it's still hard work. While you're doing that, um, I think there are three things that can help to focus you and, and uh, like make you better imaginers of metaphors. The first is um, just always remembering and focusing on that bridge. So um, whatever metaphor you have come up with or as you're coming up with them, really thinking about what are the features of X that make it like Y? And but once you come up with your metaphor, keeping that like in the foreground for yourself, so you're focusing, you're visiting on that. Uh, then uh, just uh, the whole concept of the the bridge obviously is only going to be effective as long as you're bridging to something that's familiar to your audience. And finally. Um, your main goal in this is to um, support the, the user's finding meaning. So I think in the user experience um, um, kind of um, workflow, it's pretty accepted that um, a good way of doing that is uh, you are um, designing for user's goals. So it's kind of like goal-driven design. And so what I like to think of it as is um, meaning-driven design. So you're really looking for um, to design your metaphors around things that will um, help users to find the meaning visually, but also um, understand why it um, matters to them or why it's meaningful to them. Thank you. <laughs>